Now this program defines an interface as well, but this one is called the notifier interface. And the notifier interface sets a constraint that concrete data must exhibit this method notify to be compliant with the interface itself. So this interface implements one act of behavior named notify. It takes nothing, returns nothing. Now just below the interface declaration, I define a concrete type. Again, concrete types define and represent the problem. Interfaces do not define and or represent the problem. They represent the behavior that data must be must conform to in order for that data to be passed around your program in a polymorphic way. But it's this user that really defines the problem in front of us. And this user implements the notifier interface using pointer semantics there on line 22. Now, just for consistency in teaching, I added a polymorphic function. We really don't need it but it helps right now with this example. And once again, I want you to be aware that this polymorphic function is not asking for data based on what it is. It's asking for data based on what it can do. It is saying I will accept any piece of concrete data that knows how to notify. Not caring what it actually is, caring about what it can do. And so we go back and we do what we did before. I construct a value of type user and initialize it with my name. And then just like before, I try to pass this value to our polymorphic function. And the compiler says, sorry, Bill, but this piece of concrete data that you're trying to pass across this program boundary does not exhibit the full method set of behavior defined by that function. And we're like, what you talking about? I did everything you asked, compiler. You said right here on line 44 that data must exhibit the full method set of behavior defined by notifier. Notifier has one act of behavior, notify. Compiler, there it is. There's my notify method. I think you have a problem because the behavior has been defined. And the compiler turns around again and says, Bill, I'm going to say it to you one more time. This piece of data that you're trying to pass into that polymorphic function does not exhibit the behavior that must be defined. So now we scratch our heads. Why is this error coming up if the method has been declared? Eric, show me. Because there is a set of rules in the Go spec that define what methods for a particular type get bound to what values of that type. Remember, when I use the word data, I'm talking about both values of that type and addresses of that type. And this is the kind, this is what we work with all the time. We're either working with a value of some type or that value's address, right? That's our data. And so the method set rules define what behaviors get attached to data. Now I'm gonna lay out the method set rules on the board. Um, they're a little confusing, but I'm gonna lay them out the way the spec does and then we're going to talk about it. I'm going to show you an easier way to think about it. So this is what the spec says as it relates to the method set rules. The spec says, if the data you are working with is a value, is a value of type T, then only those methods implemented with value semantics or attached to values of type T. Only methods defined using value semantics, value receivers, are attached to values of type T. If what you're working with is a pointer, an address, right, of type T, then all methods defined both using 
pointer semantics and value semantics are bound to that address data. In other words, the full method set of behavior is attached to pointers or addresses. But only those methods implemented with value semantics are attached to values of type T. The big question is why is the compiler not attaching pointer semantic methods to values of type T? Well, what I want to say to you right now is what this chart is really showing you is how much Go loves you. This is love right here. This is Go love. This is Go saying, I love you and your software so much that I'm not going to put it into a state where you can lose integrity. I want everybody to take a picture of this chart. And if you're ever home alone, feeling lonely, like nobody loves you, I want you to take the picture out and go, at least Go loves me. I have to do this about once a week, so it's all good, OK? I know at the end of the day, at least Go loves me because of the method set rules. Go is doing this because it's trying to prevent integrity issues in your software. Now, there's two levels of integrity issues here. If the compiler were to attach pointer semantic methods to values, there's a, I would call a minor one, and then there's a major one. So let's talk about the minor one first, the minor one first. What if I told you that not all values that you work with are addressable? What if I told you that you can't necessarily take the address of every piece of data you may work with? If you can't get the address to a piece of data, you can't share it. And so integrity has to be this all or nothing situation. Let me show you that. Eric, back to the machine. I'm going to go to example number four. So I've got this duration type there on line 10. And then I implement a method named notify using pointer semantics. Now look at what I do here. I take a literal value of 42, convert it into a value of type duration, try to call the notify method. And the compiler says, sorry, Bill, can't call that method. Can't take the address of that value. Why can't the address take the address of this value? Because technically, literal numbers in Go are constants. This one now happens to be a constant of type duration. And constants only exist at compile time. Constants in Go are not read-only variables. This value is not on any stack or heap. It would be hard-coded in any assembly that would be produced. So I want you to realize that this is a value that is at play, but it's not addressable because it's a constant. Now, Again, one could argue that this value of type duration 42 does implement the notifier interface. But since you can't call pointer receivers on it, if we allowed that to be stored inside the interface, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Hmm. But this is the minor one. This is the minor one. There is a major thing here. Come back to the board that I want to share with you. And to see this major, major issue here, or what the major thing that the compiler is trying to protect you from, I'm going to carve out a small piece of this chart. And I want you to focus your eyes right just in here. And instead of focusing on the data, let's focus on the behavior, right? Because because what we have here is the data. And over here, we're talking about behavior. And so let's focus on the behavior side for a second. And I think what happens is pretty magical. What the compiler is saying to you is that if the data semantic you've chosen is pointer semantics, 
And remember, when was that chosen? At the time you defined the type. It wasn't chosen. You define the type of data. You choose the semantic. Then you can write code. You cannot write code until you've chosen a semantic or you know what the semantic is. You could be wrong. You prototype. You didn't like it. You switch it. I do it all the time. Sometimes you figure it out an hour. Sometimes it takes a month. <laughs> but eventually, you get a feel for your API and a feel for that data, and then things start to have clarity. But what this is saying is, is that if you chose pointer semantics, then the only thing you're allowed to do with the data as it relates to the interface is share it. That's it. What the compiler is telling you is that you are never, never, ever, ever, never, 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 ever, and I said this yesterday, ever allowed to make a copy of a value that a pointer points to. There is no integrity in that. By not including pointer semantic methods here, what the compiler is doing is restricting the ability of this shared piece of data to be copied. We don't want that. It's no good. If you're in value semantic mode, then we want copies of data to be stored inside the interface. We want to maintain our value semantic consistency. You choose pointer semantics, you're restricted to just share. You choose value semantics, let's copy. However, and I told you yesterday, there are times where you're in value semantic mode and you might need to switch to pointer semantics. We saw that with decoding. We saw that with unmarshalling. And once you switch into pointer semantic mode, you're locked in until you come back out of that call chain. And so what this chart is also saying is there are times where when you, still, when you are in value semantic mode, you might have to take that share exception, decoding, unmarshalling, things like that. It's amazing what these, this little chart shares with you, what the method set rules are doing. Again, this stuff is over a decade old. And so once we choose pointer semantics for our data, then from an interface perspective, we're only able to share it. We can't be making copies of it. So if we come back to the code, I want you to look here on line 21 that we're using pointer semantics. This is what we've chosen. And we're using value semantics here on the call. The compiler says, no, 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 no. We don't allow that. So if you want this data to be stored inside, if you want to pass this to the polymorphic function, you must keep with the pointer semantics that were defined here. Not going to let you move in that other direction. Bop, now it works. So I need you to remember that these data semantics run deep. They are there to protect you and the state of your program. And here's a case where the compiler comes in and makes it clear that if you're in pointer semantic mode, that is where you're staying. If you're in value semantic mode, we prefer that you maintain that by allowing copies to be made up and down that call path. But when you have situations like decode and unmarshal, you can take that exception and it's available to you.